thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak with you. And uh, what, that's a hard act to follow, so I'll, I'll try to <laughs> keep it positive. Um, but what I want to offer today is a search for a framework. And when you think about it, we go through life and we can't be rethinking everything every minute, every day. You have to have a framework as you go through this day to frame the events, to help guide what you're doing. And what I'm offering is that we need a new framework because something significant is really about to merge. And to put it in this term, if someone would say billions and billions of new animals are about to migrate to the upper plains, or billions of people are about to show up, or there's gonna be a, you know, an explosion in the birth rate, you'd say, well, we have to start thinking about social structures, transportation, job opportunities, all the rest. Well, something like this is coming. But our frameworks right now can't handle that. Our old theories, our old frameworks are failing. Now, I couldn't ask for a better lead-in to this type of talk this year other than the election cycle. Think about it. We almost had a socialist running for president, and we have a billionaire running for president. I don't think we've ever had that before. Those of you who follow the news, Great Britain is leaving the EU, completely unanticipated, stock markets gyrating. What is going on? Yet, day to day, you feel like things are going okay. And that is because the, the micro frameworks you have at the micro level, things work. Getting up, going to work, making your dinner, sending your kids to school, but they're incomplete once you go to the macro level. And so what I suggest is that the framework today has to involve technology, that we have a macro revolution occurring right now while you're alive, and that's the wonderful thing. You are here when this is happening, and several theorists are talking about this is the most important time on this planet, bar none, because of what's happening with artificial intelligence and what I would call a third realm of actors. Now, the reason I use the word realm is I didn't want to say ecosystem or subsystem, but a realm implies like the animal kingdom or the king of the realm that involves not just the possibilities of life, what's going on, but ethics, policy, law, norms, all those things together. And this framework I would suggest to you is important because the challenge we will have going forward is epic. We'll have a challenge to create this technology, to compete for the business people here, competitive advantage, also to control this technology because it is digital and we already know in the news it can be sometimes hard to control digital technology, but also civilize this realm. This is the law, policy, ethics, and all this is happening while we are here and you will have a huge impact on future generations depending on how we do this. So, this is a one-liner here, but it's important because I've talked to many audiences in my time helping with the Defense Science Board as a recovering professor, and it was interesting. When I asked people about their theories of life, people had theories of law, they had theories of politics, those, those are kind of going out the window this year. They had theories of economics, but a few people had theories of, of humans and machines or technology, but those theories are out there, and I'll offer a couple of my own for you. The first one I would say is, you need to think about macro versus micro. And for those of you who went through college economics, there's microeconomics and macro, but think about it with regard to revolutions. That business people and technologists have dealt with micro-revolutions quite frequently, right? Going from a manual transmission to an automatic transmission revolutionized driver training and the skill level required of driving. You think about going from propeller to jet. Those were micro-revolutions. But when you take all these things, you start to add them together and add digital artificial intelligence what we'll see is the emergence of an entirely new structure of economic, social, military activity. And I'll show you historically, these have happened before. So we have some lessons we can learn from history. So in the past, the world functioned with two realms of activity. And the first one was centered on the human, the animal, and nature. This was approximately 10,000 BC, roughly, with the rise of agricultural communities, going from hunter and gathering to agriculture. They become complex, but they relied on human labor and animal labor. Think of the Roman Empire, massive complex structure built on actually slave labor. And there still is a human natural realm of activity. It's in your home, it's when you turn your iPhone off and you just interact with people and in other activities, uh, teacher in the classroom, unaided by technology, human contact. It still exists today. Now approximately 1588 in the military realm of activities, there was a complete upheaval. It's beyond the scope of this lecture, um, but basically superpowers were upended because one country teamed with the machine, others tried to use mass labor. 
Most of us remember this as the Industrial Revolution, starting about 250, 300 years ago, when humans and machines came together to build a complex set of machine human teams. Well, now we're having a third realm that may not need us. It will work completely between machine to machine communications and activity. And this is, I would say, emerging in the last couple of years. So this isn't a fad. I've had some people go, well, that will come and go. But I would argue that the history of human innovation has been to expand possibilities. And this is the positive thing, expand possibilities to better sense and think and act in the world. And we have done this first with just human senses, and then we augmented with machine senses. The glasses I wear was an early innovation about the year 1300, Da Vinci invented the telescope to better see. Then we moved with radar, sonar, infrared. We then began to add thinking aids. The human mind is incredible, as you heard an earlier speaker talk about. It is no longer the dominant processor because now we have computers and this thing called Watson, if you're familiar with it. Acting on the world, we dominated that, aided by animals, but then we began to team with machines. But the point is humans seek to expand their possibilities, sensing, thinking, and acting in the world using technology. And this is a motive force that is going to lead into this autonomous possibilities. Now, that's a grand statement, but it's important for us here at each level to understand we all have something to play here. And this is one of my favorite quotes from a guy named James Benninger, who unfortunately died at an untimely young age. And at every class I taught on technology, I had my students read this first line of his book because we are all part of this. And those of you who come from faith traditions, you have a framework to situate yourself in life, but I would argue those who don't are part of something huge happening, and it's happened a couple times before. So there are a bunch of big theorists talking about this, Ray Kurzweil, Kevin Kelly, uh, Douglas Rushkoff, they write about it in general global terms. But what I wanna offer is this transformation going from the human natural realm to machine realm, which can inform us on what we may be facing, this happened just a few miles from here with my family. The Hagerot family homesteaded in the 1880s, and they basically inserted from Germany as a young, poor, three brothers coming out of a small village in Germany into basically agricultural-based society that was based on human sensing, thinking, acting, aided by the horses you see there with a very basic machine. But then they began to be part of something that expanded those possibilities. So if you look at that little graph they have there, think about this as, in fact, it's convenient that Ted has a black background. Think of a universe of possibilities that we can't get to, but once you start to team with humans and nature, with animals and rudimentary machines, you start to expand possibilities. The agricultural revolution expanded wealth, it led to the creation of cities, and here in North Dakota, it led to the founding of cities that were basically agricultural centers of commerce. So watch, however, though, a progression began that shocked the world. Jefferson and Hamilton, famous people in our history, talked about the impact of technology on manufacturing. They debated what it would do to factory workers, but Jefferson always thought agriculture would stay small scale, centered on families and people. But then watch what happened on the Hagerot farm over the next couple decades. So here we're picking the threshing example. Animals, obviously prominent in the photo, probably two of their favorite workhorses. The machine is in the background, hidden by this, and the laborers were actually benefiting. There's less back-breaking labor. I mean, they're actually leaning on some of their tools here as the machine, as you can see, is doing some pretty powerful threshing there, throwing up the chaff. So humans, animals coming together with the machine in the background, and it hadn't changed the structure. Now, look at this picture. Here you see animals, less prominent, a machine, a threshing machine that sits stationary, but now a mobile tractor is coming in. Someone quite proud standing there. Humans, animals, a machine moving, that can now move through human animal space. So this is all fairly manageable. Now here you have the animals are gone, <laughs> okay? The tractor is almost the most important thing showing. My grandfather's right there, George Hagrot, quite proud, and he became just the master machine mechanic. Uh, my dad is still farming out by Crown Bee today. And lots of workers are all there, and there's even more in the background here, but clearly something has changed. Bit by bit, it's changing. And now here, the transition is complete from human-centered labor with animals to threshing time. My grandfather here, if you can't see him, kind of shadowed there, with the equipment that he could do the whole harvest himself. Now, the Hagrods were ahead of their time, but they were all part of this emerging second realm of human machine teaming. So this is how I would submit the world is looking like for your grandparents. 
And that was a progression from human animal centered society and structures, a transitional period, and then you come to where the animals are gone, most of the workers are gone, and you now have a huge, massive realm of possibilities that opened that weren't possible. All the people going to the cities, doing art, music, creating new technologies. But it was very disruptive for many people I heard stories about. Cooney, Butler, Lend Risch, Norm Jacobson, people who all lost their jobs. The Millette family lost their home. The Hagerots adapted by embracing technology. But look what they were part of, a massive event that historians recorded in the 1960s. This was a famous graph by Bruce Gartner's book, American Agriculture in the 20th Century. This is what they were part of, a massive event that changed history. What is here on the right are the population of horses and mules. Since the Middle Ages, when horses and mules replaced oxen, America peaked at 27 million. By the time this transition was over, I remember 1910 was when that first photo was, so the Hagarods were ahead of the time. By 1960, decimated, one-tenth. Meanwhile, these things that didn't even exist on the farm, tractors, went from zero to four million, or actually almost five million, in the course of a couple generations. Here in North Dakota, mechanized much faster. But they were all part of this epic event. And again, the United States did pretty well. But if you know your history about China and Russia, collectivization resulted in, unfortunately, massive catastrophe as people were forced off the farms. So what is happening? This is happening again. And it is the rise of artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, robotics are going to build the equivalent of graphs like that, which will create wealth, opportunity, incredible possibilities to expand that space, but there will be dislocations. Now, just as a caveat, for I know there's some IT people here, there is, to make this even more complicated, there is another macro event happening, a fourth realm, and that's cyberspace, which is beyond the scope of this talk. But think of why it is so exciting to be alive. You have intelligent, ambulatory machines coming into our world, which I think is the most important thing. But then those who want to can opt into cyberspace and the incredible possibilities that are there. So uh, that's beyond the scope of this talk. So what would this mean then when we lay this out? And that is basically the machine realm of possibilities that are happening right here in the upper Midwest. This is the Hermes 450, the first test of the United States for agriculture. So this machine only, intelligent machines communicating through digital networks is happening right here. So the framework I'm now offering, will lay it out here. This is how it started with agricultural societies centered on the human and animals, and it still exists. The sizes of course would be much smaller depending on which market you'd look at. Represented by my great uncle, Walter Hageron. Integrated, finally, coming to a very small population of workers where most of the work, sensing, thinking, acting is done by machines, and then finally completely autonomous. So this is the framework that we think through of how you navigate within, across, how much do we allow to overlap, where do you make investments, all right? And so let's look at this now with the human natural realm, visionaries protected 100 years ago, the national parks, Teddy Roosevelt, Muir, just west of here. They saw something happening, they didn't know exactly what, but they protected millions of acres from basically industrialization and it is our legacy we have today. Then the integrated realm emerged, people navigating that, and we're navigating that today. This is a picture of one of those threshing machines you saw in the background, and my cousin Steve Hagerot and I, with a drone he built, that now has actual limits on where the drone can fly. People are navigating this, the FAA is setting rules, North Dakota is leading the the country on thinking through these, of basically having a limited overlap of where people live, how late at night they can fly. So navigating these new technologies, and I forgot to admit, make this point, the National Park Service has actually put limits now on this realm. Completely autonomous machines are not allowed to fly in national parks. Humans with their cars can fly in, humans can come in, can drive in, they can come in with their cameras, but the idea of drones being unmonitored going into national parks has been limited. So already these people are thinking through these things day by day, like Benninger would say, in part of this framework. What the challenge we have now, and that's why the shapes are different, the overlap is different, depending on your realm of the economy or your area of the economy or government or the military, is where do you draw lines? Where do you have overlap? So a couple things, we had a wonderful lead in that was very positive, but people can get it wrong. So if you look at the human natural realm, Earlier in this century, they had the national parks 100 years ago this year, 
And then they began a series of things. Once they realized the industrialization of our economy, they led to things that happened right here in the upper Midwest. The Grange movement, the progressive movement, uh, the nonpartisan league, the Bank of North Dakota, different things to help be sure that what was happening in these areas was protected and people were improved in their life. Now, um, the last point I'd make is that these things are important to think about early, is that in the military, where we've got two wonderful bases up here, the, the transition from the human and the natural to the integrated human and machine was not navigated well. While Teddy Roosevelt and Muir were building these wonderful parks, the generals, the admirals, the people that preceded me in my career completely misunderstood this connection. And for those of you who have studied the history, in World War I, we sent infantrymen, including an uncle of mine, George Menke, into the machine guns, into the artillery, which led to loss of human life of such epic proportions that literally kingdoms fell. The Russians fell, the Germans fell. Today, your military officers are thinking right now about this transition between manned flight, manned ships and planes, and the implications here. There has already been the first arms control sessions in Geneva, of which I was part of the first one in 2014, on how do we protect humans from the expansion of lethal autonomous systems into human space. So all these things are playing out at the government level, the military level, economic level, but in your own lives of how much do you work with your children on technologies and your families. So again, it's a great world we're in, and uh, I hope this framework is helpful to you. Thanks very much. Thank you.